So our first reading today is from Isaiah. It's from Isaiah 53, um, just before verse 3 and to verse 7. Isaiah says, He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought to us peace was on him and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you and to those that are watching on YouTube. Uh, I was watching last week our IMC's first live streaming event, uh, and I saw um, Dave Martin, and he made a, a reference to the fact that Jesus had a choice. He was talking about Palm Sunday, and he talked about Jesus having a choice. And that got me thinking. Um, and so the theme for me, obviously, is Good Friday, and that's a very definite theme. Uh, but it is about the choice that God had to send his son. Now, throughout the Gospels, uh, there are many, many references to the Old Testament. Isaiah gets more than most. Isaiah is quoted many, many times. And this particular chapter, chapter 53 of Isaiah, is quoted uh, more than any other. Uh, and it is the chapter which contains the heart of our Christian belief. Several hundred years before Jesus walked the earth physically, the prophet Isaiah looked into the future and could see that God had a plan. Uh, and I, I guess this is one of those psalms which we, sorry, psalms, this is one of those readings that we hear so often we perhaps need to slow down and just think about what Isaiah is actually saying here. Uh, because Isaiah is saying that we have a problem. The very first book of the Bible, the first two or three chapters of that book, explain how that problem arrived. Uh, the story of Adam and Eve, however you accept it, however you believe it, it tells us that we have fallen from a position of walking with God to being separated from him. God and human beings separated by sin. And that is the starting point of the problem. We disobeyed God. We were ashamed of our nakedness. We hid from him. The world changed. Theologically, we call it the fall. And God knew that he was going to fix that. And he was going to fix it in a very costly manner. And so when I was preparing for this, I was just intrigued. Something that uh, uh, one preacher said, he said, um, you know, when you read the Psalms, it talks about how God creates the universe, the stars, with his fingers. And elsewhere, it talks about how God's mighty arm or mighty hand uh, helped them, the Hebrew people, leave Egypt. So he uses his fingers to create a universe. It takes rather more of himself to get his people out of Egypt. But it costs him everything to get us 
back into that relationship with him. It cost him more than it did to create a universe in the first place. That was fingers. And in our reading from Isaiah, he was despised and rejected by mankind. Yes, we kind of get that. We can see that in the Easter story. But we kind of leave it in the Easter story. It happens now in our own lives. We still reject him in so many ways. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God. He was pierced for our transgressions. Now I wonder if you actually take that on board. We are sinners. It's not a popular idea. You know, I have to try and get these ideas across to year 10 and 11 students in the, the place I teach. Uh, and trying to get the idea of sin across, the idea of the fall, uh, they struggle with it. Um, and Isaiah is saying something very different to every other world religion. He's saying that we can't put it right ourselves. Um, alongside Christianity, I also teach GCSE uh, Islam. And in Islam, your works, as long as they outweigh your sins, you're okay. If you go to the Eastern religions, then if you mess up this time, as you're likely to, you'll have another chance. You'll be reborn again as something else. You can have another crack at it. But Isaiah is saying, no. He's saying the sin is part of who and what you are because of the fall. And it takes a specialist to sort it out, to put it out. <clears throat> I'm going to, in a minute, I'm going I'm to conclude this talk, and Dawn's going to give us our uh, gospel reading. Uh, and then you're going to see a picture. And the picture's called The Shadow of the Cross. It's by a guy who you've probably heard of, Holman Hunt. Um, and I want you to think of that, that phrase, The Shadow of the Cross, because I'm going to suggest to you that it stretches right the way back. Isaiah here is talking about the shadow of the cross. What it is going to cost God himself to get us back into a relationship with him. To put right the events of the fall. To get back to that, you know, I love the fact that names are so important in the Bible. And the word Eden means delight. And Adam means man or mankind. And you have this idea of mankind walking in a place called delight. Uh, I like that idea. That's a good thing. And I want that. I want to be back there. And I know that there is only one way that I can get there. Now, I've, I've told this story here before, but on the day that I became a Christian, I did a sort of a, an old-fashioned altar call at a church in Weymouth, St. John's uh, Church of England. It's on the seafront, if you know Weymouth. Uh, and it was a guy called J. John was the evangelist. And he used a very graphic image. And it is a very graphic image. And I'm going to share it because on Good Friday, if we dare, we look into the face of Jesus on the cross. And the image he used, he said, your sin is like an open wound oozing pus it's vile it's horrible and it's just weeping and as much as you try and clean it out it just keeps oozing and weeping and so God has to take his son Jesus like a piece of cotton wool and he cleans out that mess the pus and the sin and now because his son is so solid and so dirty throws him away in the bin. And I remember all those years ago when I was 18 years of age, that image really struck me. My God loved me so much, he was willing to give everything to make me clean. Our next reading is going to take us a little deeper uh, into that story. So 
Okay, our second reading for today is from Mark 15, verses 21 to 41. But just before we start that, um, let's just think about the Easter story just briefly and where we've got to. So yesterday, on Monday, Thursday, the disciples had met together to celebrate the Jewish Passover with the meal. And we call that meal the Last Supper because it was Jesus' Last Supper where Jesus broke the bread and shared the wine as a symbol of his body and his blood given for us. I don't know if the disciples understood that. Later in the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus had gone to pray, Judas arrived and betrayed Jesus with a kiss to identify him to the soldiers. Jesus had been taken to Pilate, who couldn't understand why Jesus wouldn't defend himself. He was mocked and dressed as a king in a purple robe, the crown of thorns for his head. He was whipped and beaten, but still he would not speak. From here to Herod, who condemned him to death by crucifixion. So now Jesus is made to walk to his death, carrying his cross, which was a heavy burden. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing on his way from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to the place called called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him, dividing up his clothes. They cast lots to see who would get, which, what each would get. It was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The notice of the charge against him read the king of the Jews. They crucified two rebels with him, one on his right, one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads, saying, So you, who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this Messiah, King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lima sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, listen, he's calling Elijah. Someone ran and filled a sponge with wine vinegar and put it on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, Surely this man was the Son of God. Some women were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the younger, and of Joseph and Salome. In Galilee, these women had followed him and cared for his needs. Many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem were also there. If the technology allows, is it possible to put the picture up? Uh, Okay, it's not at its best because of the brightness in the church. Uh, Probably one of the better known Holman hunts is where Jesus is on the outside of the door without the handle, knocking on the door of people's lives, uh, asking to be invited in. But this one, it's very different. Uh, it could just be a scene from a workshop, a carpenter's workshop at the end of a day, uh, and his mother's in the shop. Now, I don't know how well you can see it there. It looks a little dark from here. Um, but Holman Hunt is very, very precise and deliberate with everything he does. Uh, and Jesus is stretching at the end of his work, 
and unmistakably he forms the shape of a cross and the, the shadow behind him is the shadow of a cross. On the wall behind him are carpenter's tools, hammer and nails, all too significant. Uh, his mother Mary is opening a chest at, at the foot on the floor uh, and you may not be able to make it out from where you are but uh, you can see, you can glimpse inside the chest the gifts that were given her uh, by three wise men 30, 33 years before. Uh, gold, frankincense and myrrh. And I just wanted to flag that image up to, to help with the, the, the way I'm trying to get your minds to go here. To just think through the fact that the shadow of that cross stretched way back. It was there at his birth. It was there in the days of Isaiah. And it reaches right the way back to those events in Eden, in whatever form they took. All right, thank you for the picture. Uh, if you remember the Christmas story, and in my head you cannot distance Easter from Christmas. Easter is the whole purpose, it's the reason. Christmas has little meaning without the events of Easter. And those three gifts that Jesus is given, uh, the gold, the sign of kings, the frankincense, uh, the priestly gift, but of course the myrrh, which we're told in our Sunday schools uh, quite correctly, that that is the gift of death. That is the, the stuff that you smear into the bandages that you wrap around, or the cloth that you wrap around the corpse to try and um, fight off that sense of decay and putrefaction, to try and give it a, a more pleasant scent, try and make death something nicer than it really is. It was there at his birth. Now, I don't know about you, but I've given some fairly naff gifts in my time. Um, I've received one or two. I count socks as naff gifts, so I get lots of naff gifts. Uh, but this one, gold, sorry, myrrh to our new mother. She knew what it was about. You know, there's a line in Luke where it says, Mary pondered these things in her heart. She knew what was going on. She carried it all for all of those years, knowing that her son was destined for something, something terrifying. But then, of course, 30 years after his birth, we have the beginning of his ministry, and that's marked by his baptism. And I've, I've never really thought of it this way before, but, uh, you know, where Jesus is baptized by John the Baptist and the, the gospel writers describe the Holy Spirit coming down him, and it says, like a dove. I've always thought of that as something as lovely and pleasant and nice and, you know, a sign of peace and all of that. But, of course, for the Jews, that dove would have had a different significance because the dove was the thing that you sacrificed if you couldn't afford a lamb or a sheep. The dove was the poor man's sacrifice that you had to give at the temple. And so as well as the, the symbolism that we usually associate with the Holy Spirit, there's also a sense at his baptism, beginning of those three years, a sense of doom hanging over him, a sense of sacrifice. And at many, many places through the gospel story, all the gospels point out that Jesus at various times is well aware of what, where he's going and what's going to happen. Caesarea Philippi, possibly the best one in Mark, uh, where he points out to you know, Simon Peter, I'm going to Jerusalem and to the cross. And then he rebukes Simon Peter when Simon Peter tries to turn him away from that. But that's where he's headed. And roughly, well, just over a third of Mark's gospel equates to the last seven days of his life. There's a real focus there on these events. Now, 
Crucifixion, as we all know, is a horrendous way to go. But we, we still distance ourselves from it, even today, 2,000 years on. Um, um, archaeological discoveries tell us a little bit more about how a, a Roman crucifixion would have happened. Um, most crucifixions that you see, or if you see somebody wearing a crucifix, the feet are crossed over. Um, we now know from the evidence that they would actually have been individually nailed or spiked so either side of the upright pole. So your weight is on your left or right foot, and you'd have to push down on that to just to breathe. We've also always assumed that always depicted in, in films and in literature, you always see the cross is on a hill. The Romans, we know, crucified people pretty much at eye level. The entrance on the road into a Roman city often would have been lined with crosses and there would have been dying criminals from a Roman perspective nailed to them at eye level. So as you entered that city, you would be looking into the eyes of these people who were dying in agony and that was quite a stark reminder that you don't mess with the Romans, that Roman law Roman justice rules, and the punishment for breaking it is severe. So I kind of, um, when you think about those people who are attending the crucifixion, there were crowds there, they were hurling abuse at him, Mark tells us that, and Mark's account is the, the stark outline of it, you know, you'll get more detail and different detail <coughs> in some of the other gospel writers, but he gives us the basics. But he says there were five people there for him. There were lots against him. And the five that were for him were three Marys, his mother, Mary Magdalene, uh, Mary the wife of Clopas. Uh, there was John and his aunt. And when I read that, I'm thinking, where are all the rest? A week ago, we had David Martin talking about, you know, he brought in the Notting Hill Carnival and the processions and celebrations because he was trying to get across the enthusiasm of Palm Sunday, an amazing event. And just one week later, out of all those thousands that sang Hosanna, and lay down the, the palm leaves and their cloaks on the floor in front of him. They're not there anymore. The few that are there are to be abusive and to give him a hard time, to pour scorn on him. But of his friends and disciples and those that had cheered, five. And I've been thinking about this. If I had been one of those disciples, I'm fairly sure you would not have seen my face at that cross because I'm a real chicken when it comes to that kind of thing facing death facing somebody that I'd got close to go through horrible you know the worst thing imaginable and when you think that he would have been at eye level not up there you know the Romans didn't make things more harder for themselves than it had to be far easier to put somebody at eye level and the evidence suggests that it was at eye level. You would be looking straight into the eyes of the man you'd spent three years with, the man whom you'd put your faith and your hope and your trust in, the man who you called your friend and he called you his friend. And you would have seen the mess that the Romans had left of him. You know, if you are feeling brave enough, I would encourage you to watch Mel Gibson's The Passion of the Christ. It's truly horrible, but the crucifixion is truly horrible. Uh, and you see what a Roman flogging does to a man's back. The reason why Mark says our reading started off as somebody else having to carry the crossbeam was because Jesus' back was a mess. It had been chewed apart. So, 
I would ask you, where would you have been that day? Would you have dared to go to the foot of that cross? Being at the cross is a difficult place to be. It's a challenging place to be. Being at the foot of the cross changes people. We saw that in Mark's Gospel. The Roman centurion on guard at the crucifixion to make sure nobody interfered. Truly this man was the Son of God. He saw something in Jesus' death. He saw something in that. Maybe it was the words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's where the bit of cotton wool that he used to clean out my sin is now sullied and disgusting and thrown into the bin. I did that. So no, I don't think I would have had the nerve, the courage to be at that cross and to watch him die. But you know, this is Friday. Sundays are coming. There may be a, a Friday in your life that isn't just a good Friday feeling where there seems to be no hope, where things just seem beyond any human possibility of change for the better. This is Friday. Sundays are coming. I'm going to leave you with that. Now, before I do finish, I will just say huge thanks to Carla, who's pretty much taken on the musical side of this single-handedly. Um, so it is very much appreciated. And the guys at the back who've been uh, fighting the technology, um, which gets ever more complex, um, thank you guys. It's appreciated. Uh, we're going to move on to a song which says some of the things that I've been saying, but far better. Um, I'll say to those of you, this is a, a Good Friday service, and I guess many of you may be expecting certain kind of hymns and things. Um, the final hymn is one that you will um, be expecting. Um, but as you can't sing, I was trying to think of things which uh, help you to reflect on the whole business uh, and maybe see the words in a different way or just have time to think about the words. So they are kind of reflective songs, and I hope you appreciate that. Um, over to Carla. <laughs> 